Small business needs customers. Customers need small business. Goodland offers a one-of-a-kind search marketing platform that does the work for everyone. For customers, it's a digital coupon machine, helping you save your hard-earned money. For businesses, it's advertising in your area without the headache of marketing or software that makes you pay to win. Goodland will reveal the businesses and customers you didn't know existed. For example, Joel spent 12 years working with wholesalers to give you the most affordable price, but he can't compete with large corporations who outspend him in advertising. Lauren grows organic produce and sells products with ingredients you can pronounce. But because she doesn't have a website, she practically doesn't exist. John makes the best flooring in town, but he hasn't been around long, so he's buried in traditional search engines. Goodland gives you the power to get in front of people. Our money is power, and where we spend it matters. If we buy from people like them, we support the very community we live in. That money goes for food on the table, dance shoes or a special family night out, or that money comes right back to you. No longer are we forced to buy from corporations that don't support our community. You now have high quality options that are closer and more affordable, all while building a local chain of supply and demand to be sufficient and sustainable amongst ourselves. Join Goodland with a free trial today and see what Goodland can do for you. talked about a lot of things leading up to this in the previous 18 parts but part 19 we're going to be jumping into um, some mysterious topics that things that have puzzled people for a long time both in the community of believers studying their bible as well as in the community of uh, science academia people that look to the stars and try to figure things out why are these things happening so tonight we're going to try to address them i'm going to put forward my best understanding of these ideas um, and I hope that you receive it just to test it, test it with me. Also, considering the nature of what I'll be talking about tonight with both broadcasts, I just want to encourage anyone that has the opportunity, that has the know-how and the technical capability to record these just in case they're removed. So it's a high likelihood. So let's look at part 19, Eclipses and the Eye of Ra. We've been talking about this whole series, Babylon. We looked at seven different parts of the past. We looked at seven different parts of the present. And we're currently looking at seven different parts of future Babylon. Even though we're currently living in present day Babylon, which is an amalgamation of countries serving one overall purpose, um, we'll be looking at where that leads to as we finish up these last three parts of the future and how all of this culminates to the day of the Lord when our Messiah returns and has to stop this, stop this, this nonsense that we are dissecting as Babylon. The Eye of Ra. This is one of the most famous symbols in all of hieroglyphs. And this, it's a, it's a, the patron god of, uh, of ancient Egypt was Ra. Ra was the falcon-headed god in some incantations. We're going to talk about one of his other representations tonight as well. But this was the symbol that was highly inscribed on almost all of their hieroglyphs, buildings, obelisks, temples, everywhere. The eye of Ra. You turn it around and make it face the other way, as if it was the right eye of the head instead of the left eye, then that would have been the eye of Horus. But either way, they were, they were considered synonymous in, in what they represented, which was the authority structure given down from Ra, their patron god, right, their head god. 
We see it everywhere. It's on reliefs, on busts, all types of museums. It's the Eye of Ra. Many people have tried to connect it to the pineal gland in the back of the head, coming out of the brainstem. But we're actually not going to talk about that tonight because there's so much of to, to look at that's already here for this understanding of who is Ra. We, we've already touched on who Apollo was, or, or what the Egyptians called Osiris, and we also touched on whom um, uh, Anubis was, which later morphed into Anubis Hermes um, because he was synonymous with Hermes to the Greeks. Now we're going to be looking at Ra. This was the often hawk-headed god who had the sun. He represented as the sun above his head, wrapped in horns. You can see this particular um, representation. He's got the servants with him on this boat. Uh, the, the doorway that is that is enclosing him, the little tabernacle, if you will, that's enclosing him on this boat is wrapped in a serpent. Um, the boat itself has an eye of Ra on it. And this was considered to be the called the boat of a million years that he flew through the sky. This was uh, very unique. He's holding the onk, that, which represented res resurrection in his hand. Part two of this series, we talked about the staff in his hand, which is a Vajra at the bottom, represent, represented his authority. This was synonymous throughout ancient India, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Hittites, the Greeks. It was a very, this staff was in a very important symbol for them. And he is synonymous with eclipses. The Eye of Ra. A lot of people don't realize the Eye of Ra is actually designed as an eclipse. The representation of Ra in ancient Egypt is not the sun. It's an eclipse of the sun. And I think it's important that we understand that. And we're going to explain why, why that's the way it is. So most of the representations in ancient Egypt, very heavily laden with occult, with the magic, sorcery, dark arts. The serpent was always wrapping the sun the image of the sun that was on top of the head coming over the forehead. In other nations, he's, he's represented as a goat god. This one's kind of this particular um, coin that someone made in representation to him actually um, connects all of the representation of him being the goats, him being the hawk-headed god, him being the serpent, um, him being the leader of Egypt, him having the onk of resurrection in his hand. Like it's, oh, there's a ton of stuff in this particular um coin and in the background you've got um anubis and osiris behind him but what's interesting is it actually shows a regular face beneath all those facades because the egyptians were the descendants of kush and, and mitzrayim mostly mitzrayim but kush put lud and mitzrayim the descendants of ham uh, that were grandchildren of Noah. And the Mitzurim, the Egyptians, uh, were cousins, if you will, to Eber, from which Abraham came, from which the Israelites came. The Israelites viewed Ra as Satan. So the character that's referred to as Azazel in the Hebrew understanding of Scripture and the order of events and where the bad guys came from, they understood the Satan character, the Azazel character, to be called Ra from the Egyptians. And they also understood that his symbol was the eclipse. So here's a, actually a beautiful photo of someone catching a partial eclipse in the sky. Here's a lunar eclipse that was happening. Now, the lunar eclipse is actually very different. We're going to talk about that as we go, but it's very different than the solar eclipse. That's why Ra is not associated with the solar eclipse, or excuse me, the lunar eclipse. He's associated with the solar eclipse. But most of their, I think this was uh, Bast, the, the, the cougar god Bast, Bast, I should say, also represented to give homage and authority and honor to the serpent wrapping the sun. Here it is again. Ra with his staff, his flail, his, uh, his uh, the same 
crook and flail that's uh, passed down to Osiris as a point of authority, riding on the boat of a million years with the wrapped sun over his head. And then here he's got the representation of the of the actual hawk head on the left of him. This is in, this is one of the um, one of the drawings from the actual temples in ancient Egypt that they just recreated with uh, modern day artwork, if you will, modern day pixelation. As you see the sun up in the top left with the shooting, the rays that are shooting out. This is also representative of what we see with the Jesuit symbol of the sun. And those particular, those rays is what you see during an eclipse. That type of irregular circular ray that you see is what we see with the eclipse. We're going to look at some footage of that here in just a minute. The times of the eclipse, there was a um, celebration. There were rituals. There were sacrifices to the ancient peoples. The eclipse was a big deal because they were seeing the eye of Ra. Ra also associated with the goat. Here in ancient Egypt, he stands over a picture of Osiris, or actually the ram head in this particular one, stands in authority over Osiris underneath him. This is the symbol, one of the symbols of Ra. Just one of the symbols. And it's the sun glyph. And it's also the symbol for the radius to the Greeks. And the word the radius is actually a, a mixture. A lot of people are like, I've tried to remind folks that the Greeks ruled Egypt for almost a thousand years. They, that's why, for example, some of their gods were given Greek adaptations. Like Osiris was a Greek transliteration of the word Asir which was the actually he, the Egyptian name, right? So Osiris, um, second command underneath Ra, his name is actually Greek. People don't realize this. So this word that we get, radius, is actually Ra plus Dias, which is Dias for Greek for God, Ra the God, specifically. And it was connected to being the solar deity. And specifically to this particular symbol of the solar deity. So this was their Egyptian hieroglyph for sun, why would you draw a sun like this with the black spot in the middle? <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? It's because you're looking at an eclipse. You're looking at an eclipse. Now, these are modern-day eclipses that we look at with extremely enhanced telephoto zoom lenses on very expensive cameras. But we're going to see more of what the naked eye might see from the ground as we continue. Here's another incantation of Ra. And he's got, um, there's, there's a couple of them actually here in this particular one, but one of them he still has the sun above wrapped in the horns. Here's one of their etchings, one of their glyphs. We have Ra sitting down. We have the serpent wrapping this sun. And do you guys notice something unique about this sun? What's in the middle of that sun? They actually took the time to carve into this little sun above this, this hawk-headed figure another little pronounced circle in the center of it. Because the, the sun god, Ra, was represented by an image of an eclipse. Not just the sun. Ever wonder why the world makes such a big deal about eclipses? Here's another example of an image with a double layer around it and the light shining down. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, this is just meaning that the favor of Ra was shining down on whoever this ruler was, whoever is supposed to be represented here. That's all it means. If you want to think that, that's up to you. That's that's but we're gonna keep diving in. I'm keep making a case for why this is not just the sun. Here's another example of now this is looking more in, in a history museum here. I think this one is in uh, Paris. Um, some of the artifacts, this is a capstone they pulled away, and part of the inscription or part of the drawings on the capstone was you have the eclipsed sun in the center with the wings coming out of the side. Now this looks very much like we would see from the Greeks or from the, um, the Romans, 
Also, you see these from the Acadians. We're going to talk about that as well again as we've been throughout this entire series trying to present and show that all these patron gods of these different nations, it's truly just the same family of gods. They just have slightly different artistic representations throughout each culture. But the symbolism represents the same idea, was that this particular patron god was in the sky and he could fly. And he's always represented by the sun. This is the Eye of Ra. I know a lot of people like to call it the Eye of Horus. That's semantics when it comes to understanding what those eyes meant. Whether it's the, it was the authority structure of the patron god of Egypt who looked down on the, on the people. Here's another example. One of the glyphs. The serpent's always wrapping the sun. Now is where it gets interesting. Just in case you didn't think that. In case you're already familiar with hieroglyphs that talked about Ra. Now we're going to look at some that we don't normally see. So here we have the sun above this particular character that you know looks like this other guy who's in leadership is reaching out to him. The sun is in the center of it is a beetle, particularly the Egyptian scarab. The serpent still wrapping the sun. The scarab beetle was extremely important to the Egyptians. It's in all of their hieroglyphs. As you can see here on the top left, you can see in some of the amulets and the jewelry that they made that we've preserved throughout his uh, archaeological finds. You can see a brooch um, that you, in the center. And then on the top right, you can see another glyph where it has the symbol of the sun indented because it's, <laughs> because it's eclipsed. And you have the two wings coming out of the scarab. The scarab itself was unlike any other creature, according to the Egyptians, because its colors are not produced from pigment, but from microscopic structures in their wings that are shaped to refract light in different wavelengths, some different parts of the light spectrum. This is called structural coloring. It can also be found in other animals like peacocks and some types of berries. The ancient Egyptians used the scarab beetle as an important symbol because of how the changing light angles beautified their shell. This represented the changing light angles from the firmament, Orion, during certain ages of the great year cycle, which illuminates the divine race within mankind, once again revealing their true beauty. It sounds all nice and new agey, right? But they're directly saying that this light, which angles off of the firmament, has, has different wavelengths, and we all understand this. We're going to talk about that even more as we in, in part 20. This says, this is why the god's name Kephara, who was connected to the scarab beetle, translated to he who came forth. And guys, this was just another name, another representation of Ra. Sitting on the boat of a million years with the eclipsed sun overhead holding it up, so to speak. And what they would say about the scarab beetle traditionally, culturally, is that he would roll the sun across the sky. They would watch the scarab beetle on the ground, and they often called them the dung beetle, which I think is pretty hilarious, ironic. But the beetle would take little balls of manure he would find, or little pieces of manure he would find on the dirt, and then roll it into the dust so it created a little compact ball and then he would put his eggs inside that ball, that now blackened ball that he just created and rolled across the ground. He would then put his eggs inside of it so they could grow and fertilize. And I just laugh at the amazing amount of symbolism there. If the scarab beetle connected with the symbolism represents Ra chasing the sun, and Egyptians were obsessed with poop. It was crazy. They were, this is why they were obsessed with poop. They revered Ra being represented as the scarab beetle that rolled the, the dung across the ground and fertilized the dung. Did he roll it into a flat little nice place and like, like uh, birds do and then, you know, come in and press its little feet down and create a little, a little warm spot for it to lay its eggs? No. He rolled it into an encapsulated structure, a sphere.
It's pretty interesting. So this is another representation of the scarab beetle flying through the air. It's got the wings pushing the black ball. It would make a lot more sense if it was some sort of, if it was, he didn't have wings and if it was representation, if they were just worshiping the scarab beetle because they liked some of its nature, it make a lot more sense, right? If they were just put it on the ground, just draw it being on the ground, rolling a ball on the ground. That's not what its symbolism meant. It was a representation of raw pushing through the sky, pushing a black ball. So here is an actual hieroglyph representing Ra and the incantation of the god Kfera with the actual beetle as his head. Just in case you thought I was off. Kefri, the sun god, is a form of the sun god Ra. He is usually depicted as a human with the beetle on his head or as his head. He rolled the sun across the sky, much like the dung beetle rolls a ball of dung. His name comes from the Egyptian word Kephra, or to become. Here's more little, um, I think these are the, uh, what do they call these things? They put them on the little seal signet rings. They put them on a ring. And then all these little inscriptions, they would dip in ink, and then they would, uh, or wax, and they would get to, someone in authority, whether a king or a prince or a viceroy or, you know, governor would use this as a seal. And it was of a scarab beetle with little Egyptian carvings on the backside. Oh, thank you, Anita Vega. I appreciate the super chat. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully he hasn't been scared off so far. So they have uh, wonderfully unique and colorful depictions of the scarab beetle with the wings and Egyptian findings. This is a big deal for them. It's also in their hieroglyphs, like we talked about. It represented their patron sun god, Ra. And this is what they would do. The little scarab beetles would roll the dung into the dirt and create a sphere, and then lay their eggs inside their sphere. This The beetle is fascinating um, because, like we read, this isn't pigment that's coloring its body. This is microscopic structures that refract light in different ways. That's how they can have this very unique um, appeal of changing color. One of the very few creatures designed that can do this. That can literally affect light waves and camouflage itself to its surroundings. It's not like a chameleon, which changes its skin tone color. This is literally has microscopic structures that reflects the light to however it wants to, to use different parts of the sunlight to camouflage itself to its surroundings. They're fascinating little creatures. And I think it's interesting that Ra, Azazel, is an angel made of light. This is the, this is the composition, the ontological composition of angels. They're made of, of spirit and water and light, as far as I can understand from Scripture. This is what we're promised to be made like at the resurrection, like what Yeshua, the body that he received when he was resurrected, the glorified body that we receive at the resurrection, is very similar to what the angels have already received at day one of creation. Azazel is just a rebellious angel who knows how to use and manipulate light. Fascinating little creature. This one's got some amazing little colors to it. I'm trying to blend in with the leaf, but he's still holding this brown. It's like he like he knows to camouflage instead of just being the same color as the leaf. These are unique. These are white. Um, they actually, it's unique about the white ones. They can reflect. It says the scales of the uh, psycho cyphocillus beetle consists of a random network of microscopic structures that scatter light, making it appear brilliant white. So it's like a, it's it's just amazing. It actually reflects all light, and it just shows out to be white. Now, Exodus chapter 8, verse 21. Pharaoh is refusing to let the Egyptians go. Many different plagues are starting to happen over time to the Egyptians to encourage Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, to let the Hebrews go and be free from the captivity or the slavery and go worship Yahweh in the mountain three days journey in the wilderness. Part of this dialogue 
is that one of the plagues that happens in Exodus chapter 8, verse 21 is often translated as a swarming insect, which most translators call the flies. But that, that ancient Hebrew word is an quote-unquote unknown derivation. And many translators translate it literally from what they feel from the manuscripts is a literal translation, and it ends up becoming the beetle. Exodus 8, 21. For if you are not sending my people away, behold, I'm sending against you and against your servants and against your people and against your houses, the beetle. And the houses of the Egyptians have been full of the beetle and also the ground on which they are. This is also in Exodus 8, 30 through 31. And Moses goes out from Pharaoh and makes supplication to Yahweh. And Yahweh does according to the word of Moses and turns aside the beetle from Pharaoh, from his servants and from the people. There has not been one left. This is also found in a, in a retelling of the events of the Exodus in two different literal translations of scripture. In Psalm 78, 45, he sends among them the beetle and it consumes them, the frog, and it destroys them. He sends among them the beetle and it consumes them, the frog, and it destroys them. Also in Psalm 105, he has commanded and the beetle comes, lice into all their borders. In Psalm 105 from Young's literal translation, verse 31, he says, He hath said, and the beetle cometh, lice into all their border. Yeah, West Blaze in the audience just said one of the most popular bands ever is the Beatles. The sun god Kefri, depicted as a beetle, another form of Ra, who rolls the sun across the sky. But why is it, in, is it often black? <laughs> as we saw earlier, they knew what they were painting. It wasn't a mistake. Here's another hieroglyph. This one's actually a huge beetle. I don't know if you can see it very well. It's actually a huge beetle, and inside the body of the shell of the beetle, there's two people sitting facing each other underneath an eclipsed sun. And this one's not even a full eclipse. This one's an eclipse from the top down. And above it, he's still pushing the, the sun with uh, his horns, little looks like little birds or serpents are coming off of his horns with suns above their head as well. The sun by itself, the image of the sun god Ra by itself on the boat of a million years, traveling by itself. That's interesting. This is uh, other, other cultures, for example, from the Mayans. They also worship the uh, flying serpent dragon, which is uh, Quetzalcoatl. Um, this is him coming down to chase and devour the sun. This is also similar to what we see from Rahu and in, from India. And this was another, another um, representation, if you will, of Quetzalcoatl, the, serpent, the flying serpent god from the Mayans. So let's look at eclipses for a minute. The most accepted government agencies that deal with space, quote unquote space, and luminary bodies, as the scriptures would call them. They made a huge deal about August 21st, 2017. But with a little bit of investigation, you start to see that the day of the eclipse was also the day of the new moon, specifically where the lunar phase of the moon, where the disk of the moon was not illuminated. Now, scripture tells us what the moon is and how it gets its light as it's transferred from the sun. It's not reflecting the sunlight. It's, it's energy transferred from the sun and self-illuminating after it receives that energy over a period of 14 to 15 days. But then when it when it's full, it releases that energy as it waxes and loses it till the, the disk of the moon is no longer illuminated. Did you guys realize that this always happens? The eclipses always happen when there's no light in the moon? Here's a solar uh, eclipse schedule, May 20th for 2012. Here's the lunar phase of the moon 
from May of 2012. It was a new moon also. And you can you can keep searching that if you like. You can keep looking, go through all the lunar eclipses in history. It's always on the new moon phase where there's no light in the moon. It's pretty interesting, right? I would even say it's suspect. Let's look at what the scriptures say. Yeah, West Blaze, I, I hear you. There's a lot of testimony about people during the great American eclipse of 2017 not seeing the moon anywhere before or after, days before or days after, right? Because usually the the, the period in the 29-day schedule of the moon was just a three-day period where there's no light in the disk of the moon. And so there's amateur astronomers with extremely high-powered telescope and photo, photo, uh, um, photo lenses that were looking and trying to find the new moon leading up to the eclipse and couldn't find it because there's no light in it. And we're going to go over that here as Enoch tells us about the sun and the moon. First Enoch 72, 1 through 2. The book of the courses of the luminaries of the heaven, the real relations of each, according to their classes, their dominion, their seasons, according to their names and the places of origin, according to their months, which Uriel, the holy angel who was with me, who is their guide, he showed me, and he showed me all their laws exactly as they are, and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity, till the new creation is accomplished, which endures till eternity. And this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary of the sun has its rising in the eastern portals of the heaven, and its setting in the western portals of the heaven. And I saw six portals in which the sun rises. The sixth portal in which the sun rises, and the moon rises and sets in these portals. And the leaders of the stars and of those whom they lead, six in the east and six in the west, all following each other in accurately corresponding order. Also, many windows to the right and left of these portals. Guys, the reason why it's saying windows is because the word heaven means firmament. It's a solid structure and expanse. There's actually seven described in scriptures. And the sun and moon are stuck between two layers of firmament. And they have their own course, a circuit, as we're about to read right here, which is a circumference in the same circumference of the actual firmament, the heaven. This is why it keeps mentioning these, this concept or portal. That portal just means a doorway, an opening inside of a structure. This isn't mystical. This isn't some... This isn't like the movies where, you know, a magician waves his hand and he opens a portal into another dimension. It's not that type of portal. It just It's an old word translated that means a doorway, a passageway from one physical structure into another open area. So as we keep reading, verse 4, it says, And at first there goes forth the great luminary named the sun. His circumference is like the circumference of the heaven, and he is quite filled with illuminating and heating fire. And this is the law in the course of the sun. And his return, as often as he returns 60 times and rises, the great luminary, which is named the sun, forever and ever. And that which rises is the great luminary, and is so named according to its appearance, according as the Lord commanded. As he rises, so he sets and decreases not, and rests not, but runs day and night. And his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards to size, they are both equal. So a couple things here. Even though it's using this word rises, again, that's an ancient word that's translated. We also see this in Psalm 19, 4 through 6. That Hebrew word rises that's translated, it doesn't mean going up and down. And that it means going forth and getting bigger. It rises over you as it goes forth in the sky in its circumference of the heaven above. Because it's just a light. So that's why it says it'll rise and it'll set and it never rests and never stops. And the moon is the same size. So right here we have a description of the moon and sun to their size and their motions and their placement, three major concepts that are absolutely and utterly contradictory to what the world has told us the creation looks like. So as we go through this information, I hope to remember, to, to remind everyone watching, we're using biblical cosmology we're not, we're not going to be using the idea of an occultic, pagan, heliocentric, evolutionary cosmology that denies the Creator and describes the existence completely opposite to what the Creator describes. We're going to be using the Creator's descriptions for all these terms and ideas. That's the only way that this information is going to make sense. Let's look at something real quick. I'm going to take a 
we're going to look at a, let me see here real quick, a short little clip of a amateur astronomer who has all the professional gear. And the only reason they call astronomers amateur is because they're not hired by some sort of, you know, prestigious um, foundation or university or something like that. But this guy's got, I think, 20 plus years of experience of uh, using his, his high powered telescope. So we're going to take a look at some of his observations. What you're going to see here is my footage. Hydrogen alpha scope with a double stack, a solar max. That is the sun you see with your eyes. Okay, I'm going to pan around here. And that's lens flare, legitimate lens flare that you're seeing there. There's the sun you see with your eyes. And in a second here, oh, I need to go the other way. There's lens flare. There we go. Watch the top. You'll see a little thing go by. Um, this is the first time in the spring of 2016 that I discovered the double sun. There's the sun we see with our eyes. I'm still scanning around. I'm going to scan back over and find the other object for the first time. There it is, top of frame. This is the sun we do not see with our eyes. Now, I was afraid to post this for a long time. Uh, you're going to see that it will blur out. I'll mess with focus. I put a huge wrapping paper tube over the end of the solar max scope. Um, when you see the disturbance over the face of this, that's what's going on. I'm trying to prove that this isn't lens flare, but all those there right there. Uh, I also take my hand and I do light blocking over the end of the scope, which ironically, the gentleman who I'm about to introduce to you, who you should all go sub, saw this footage way back in 2016 and he replicated what I did, uh, which I'm going to show you here in a minute, which is proof positive. Uh, now, real quick, just to let everyone know, um, this is uh, Crow Triple Seven, and um, it's actually, I'll put it, this is what it's, how you spell it. Someone put it in the chat as well as how you spell it, two R's, three sevens. Crow Triple Seven, he's had multiple, multiple problems with YouTube taking down his channel or just or banning his channel, and all he does is look up at the sun, moon, and stars and records things. Um, so this is what he's coming to the conclusion of a double sun, but it's, I know there's already people in the crowd asking, oh, wait, are there two suns? Scriptures never describe two suns. This is one of two things that would make perfect sense with the multi-layered firmament described in scripture. It's either the origin of the sun, the actual light source origin, which that then imagine a flashlight shining it on a glass door. You would see two lights. You would see through the glass door to see the actual light coming, illuminating the, the interior of the flashlight. But then you would see the place where the light is strongest and hitting the actual glass, creating what looks like another point of light that then bounces into the entire room being magnified into the open space beyond the glass. So if the sun is shining down through the firmament into our open space that we live in called the earth and our, underneath our level of firmament, then this is this makes perfect sense. Or it could just actually be part of the reflection of the sun going through the firmament. Either way, um, there's not two suns up there. And this is this is actually some of these conclusions is where people start to think, and we're going to talk about another bright object in the sky here in a minute. But some of these people will come to these conclusions because they don't think of biblical cosmology. They're not factoring that in. They're thinking of heliocentric balls and space cosmology. So then they think, oh my goodness, if he's seen two objects producing lights, one brighter than the other, then what is he seeing? It must be two suns. Oh my goodness, right? So you, you have all these Nibiru Planet X speculations that come up as a result of this way way unnecessary if you understand the actual biblical cosmology you realize how light works you can repl replicate this at the house with a flashlight and a glass screen door or a glass bowl it's very simple this is exactly what's described in scripture is what would happen from what's described in scripture with that said let's look some more because this is not just a light and this is not some sort of uh sunspot on his lens this isn't reflection or frat refraction this isn't um some sort of flare from overexposure of light this this is actually he can see this that there's a, a secondary or maybe even a primary source of light next to the main body of the sun another individual doing it scanning back there's a little bit of lens flare there's the real sun that we see with our eyes in the bottom of frame coming back into frame 
Now I'm going to load another clip that I shot. I think I did this three or four days in a row um, coming back to try to confirm this. Now here's a new clip. There's the sun you see with your eyes. That is legitimate lens flare right there. Scan out. There's the sun we don't see with our eyes on a new day. I'm confirming it once again. In a minute here, I'm going to load footage from a gentleman called Chris Van Mater, um, who took out equipment and replicated exactly what I did here, which is proof in the pudding. But he did something more. In one of the clips, you're going to see a telephone line going in front of the sun we do not see, which is also proof in itself. Again, there's the sun we see. Here comes Chris's footage. Uh, there's the name of his channel. You should all go up and sub him. There's the sun we see with our eyes. And there's the sun we do not. That noise is because this is a rip of a rip. Um, we'll have better footage of this as we move along. But there is this. He is confirming uh, in the same spot, in the same year, in spring, uh, what I did. Here comes another clip by Chris on a new day. There is the sun we do not see with our eyes with a telephone wire uh, in his field of view. When he scans back over to the regular sun, it's not there. There's the sun we see with our eyes. And again, we're back to my footage here. Um, there's the sun we see. There's the sun we do not see um, without a Hydra Alpha, Alpha scope with a double stack or a full spectrum camera. I will say... The reason why I keep saying this is the sun we see and the one we do not see, because you can only see this with this particular um, hydrogen alpha uh, solar filter that he's got on here, right? Which means it's blocking out certain types of sunlight and only allowing other types in. And it's always, it's always connected to the sun, specifically at a certain time of year that they're capturing this. This is why I just provided the, my understanding of what, what would cause this phenomenon according to biblical cosmology and how this, the creator described the sun and where it's placed in the firmament above. In a minute, we're gonna look and see the same astronomer caught another bright body in the sky that doesn't move with the sun, doesn't move with the stars, it moves strangely, so stay tuned that it is my contention this second object can be detected in visual spectrum with just normal tools at sunrise and sunset. Here comes the sun we see. So as we warm up here, I'm going to be pairing off with some people to do more work on the sun here. But there it is, ma'am. There is another object there. Uh, might well be the source of the sun that we see. And since I have stated the moon is plasma, it could also be the cause for that. There it is, man. Crow Discovery Project. Cheers. Okay. So yeah, he's a, uh, he's an interesting guy. And, um, I've actually had, he actually does a podcast, um, with our, our friend Jason Lindgren, um, from secrets of Saturn. And, uh, that's, I've, I've interviewed Jason Lindgren on here before, as you guys remember, and he's interviewed me on his channel. So yeah, you guys go check them out. Um, let's continue in first Enoch 73, one through two. And after this law, I saw another law dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon. And her circumference is like the circumference of the heaven, and her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind, and light is given to her in definite measure. So now this is Enoch being shown by Uriel how the energy from the sun is transferred to the moon and how the moon's light grows and, wane, and, and decreases throughout the month. First Enoch 77, 1 through 3. And the name of the sun, the names, it's got two names of the suns, are the following. The first name of the sun is Orger, Orgers. I can't, I can't even say it. Orgers. And the second name of the sun is Tomas. And the moon has four names. The first name is Asanya. The second is Ebla. The third is Benez. And the fourth is Ere. These are the two great luminaries. Their circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. And the size of the circumference of both is alike. So this is another time when it's telling you these luminaries, they're the same size and they're circular circumference shape is like the heaven, the firmament. People ask us all the time, Sean, how do you know that the firmament, even if it is a real structure, like the scriptures say, how do you know the shape of it is, is dome-like? I'm like, well, it tells us multiple places in scripture, and here's one of them. So in 1 Enoch 72, 37, and 1 Enoch 77, 3, the two luminaries are called the same size. So guys, this should utterly cause you to, to take a mental stop and think about what you've been taught all your life about heliocentric cosmology of a huge sun and, and we're supposedly 93 million miles away. 
revolving around that. And then our moon is a quarter of the size of the sun, of, of the, the planet that we live on. And that's revolving around us at a different speed. And just because uh, it just so happens to be that the, the, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. And so therefore when they do, according to them, when the eclipse happens and the, and the, the moon eclipses the sun, it looks like they're the same size. Because I'm trying to tell you, and we're going to be going into greater depth of this, that it's not the moon eclipsing the sun. First Enoch 77, 4 through 5. In the circumference of the sun, there are seven portions of light which are added to it more than the moon. And in definite measures, it is transferred to the seventh portion of the sun and is exhausted. And they set and enter the portals of the west and make their revolution by the north and coming forth through the eastern portals on the face of the heaven. And when the moon rises, one fourteenth part appears in the heaven, the light becomes full in her. On the fourteenth day, she accomplishes her light. And fifteen parts of light are transferred to her till the fifteenth day when her light is accomplished. That's when she's full and bright. According to the sign of the year, and she becomes fifteen parts. And the moon grows by the addition of fourteen parts. And in her waning, the moon decreases on the first day to 14 parts of her light, and on the second day to 13 parts of her light, on the third to 12, on the fourth to 11, on the fifth to 10, on the sixth to nine, on the seventh to eight, on the eighth to seven, on the ninth to six, on the 10th to five, on the 11th to four, on the 12th day down to three parts of her light, on the 13th day down to two parts of her light, on the 14th day down to half of the seventh. And all her remaining light disappears wholly on the 15th. And in certain months, the month has 29 days and once 28. And in her waning, the moon decreases to the first day. Oh, I'm sorry. just I messed up. And Uriel showed me another law when light is transferred to the moon and on which side it is transferred to her by the sun. During all the period during which the moon is growing in her light, she is transferring it to herself when opposite to the sun. During 14 days, her light is accomplished in the heaven. And when she's illumined throughout, her light is accomplished full in the heaven. And on the first day, she is called the new moon, for on that day, the light rises upon her. Okay, did you guys get that? So technically, the idea of a new moon, even though the world calls the new moon the time when it's completely dark, the scriptures say that technically the term new moon is applied when the light first starts coming back on the moon after it was dark for about three days. So we don't want to squabble too much on, on that use of that phrase, new moon, and, and but it's a slight, slight difference. But the point is, when the, when the moon has lost all of its light and the disk of the moon is without light at all, that's every single time they claim, when the, that is when the eclipse has happened during that phase of the, of the moon. And therefore, it's incredibly, nearly impossible, apparently it is impossible, according to astronomers, and people that actually have had power telescopes, they cannot see the moon getting close to the sun when they're watching an eclipse. So what's going on? First Enoch 77, 13 through 14 says, She becomes full, this is the moon, exactly on the day when she sets in the west. And from the east she rises at night, and the moon shines the whole night through, through until the sun rises over against her, and the moon is seen over against the sun. That would mean they're on opposite parts of the sky from our observation. On the south, where the light of the moon comes forth, there again she wanes till all the night light vanishes, and all the days of the month are at an end, and her circumference is empty, void of light. You guys seeing that? So when the circumference of the body of the moon, the luminary of the moon, when her light is gone, it says she's empty. She's void of light. Okay. Then it goes on to say, First in Acts 77, 77, 15 through 17. In three months, she makes the 30 days. And at the time, she makes three months of 29 days each, in which she accomplishes her waning in the first period of time, in the first portal for 177 days. And in the time of her going out, she appears for three months of 30 days each. And for three months, she appears of 29 each. And here's the interesting part, guys. At night, she appears like a man for 20 days each time. We all look up and see a face in the moon, right? Looking like a man's face. What, you, Generically and culturally, it's called the man on the moon. Okay, Enoch knew that way back then. And by day, she appears like the heaven. By day, she appears like the heaven. Meaning, 
She has the, you guys ever see the moon in the day? She takes on the bluish aspect of the sky. She appears like the heaven for there is nothing else in her. This is, I'm sorry, this is at the time where she appears 20 days, but just trying to explain to you that there's nothing else in her except her light. That's why she can appear like the blue during the day, dark at night. But then when she's lit up, that part's brilliant white with light. It's a different type of light, a different shading than we see in the sunlight during the day. So therefore, if she's gotten to her lunar phase where there's no light in her, then there's nothing else in her. That's why you can't see her in the sky. It's still on, still a physical object of some sort. Crow 777 may be right. It may actually be made of plasma. That would make a lot of sense because I've, I've done, you know, whole videos on plasma and how it's the literally one of the principal building blocks of all creation. And it's electromagnetically charged. So like, excuse me, electromagnetically charged. So it would make a lot of sense that that's how it's receiving the, the, the energy from the sun to start powering up over 14, 15 days and then start slowly losing it. So then when there's nothing else in there, it's literally just like see-through, but it's there's still matter there. It's just not congealed, you know, tightly enough so that we can still be visible. So essentially, the body, the substance of the moon is see-through when there's no light through her. There's nothing else in her except light. But there's still something there. I'm going to give credit to that. And we're going to watch a little something on that here in a minute. But let's look at another quick clip. Of Crow. So there actually, is logical. So this is going to be something that he's actually filming in an Eclipse and he sees something pretty, pretty unique. Common sense data that demonstrates the distance of the moon doesn't match what we can demonstrate. Here we have a picture of the eclipse. Now look on the right side. You can see the sun showing through the darkened lunar disk. Now the blue light. Now guys, he's he thinks he claims and he believes that it is the moon eclipsing the sun. I'm putting forward a different theory tonight. It's not it's another dark body, but it's not the moon. But and here's why. This picture that you're looking at is why when he captured this moment of the eclipse of this dark image going in front of the sun, you see that only the outer portion of this circumference of this image is see-through. You can see it on screen. It's right here in the, you, I hope you can see it. Only the outer edge is see-through. But the interior, the interior of it, also circumference-like, is not see-through. It's solid. No, no, to Helium 119, we didn't walk on the moon. Not even close. So this would make a lot of sense, right? You would think, oh, wow, that, okay, yeah, if Enoch says that the that there's nothing in the moon except for her light, then maybe maybe this is um, this this is the moon going from the sun. Because look, you can see through the outer edge, but why can't you see through the entire body of it? Why is it why is it so dark it's blocking the light of the sun? If there's nothing in it except light to illuminate it, this other than that, it's just see-through. And why would only the outer edge be see-through and not the the ninety-five percent of the bulk of its body? Yes, Jason Kenny, that's an actual picture with a high telephoto lens with a what I believe he has multiple solar filters uh, in order for him to capture the sun as a, an eclipse is happening. This is a, an astronomer. And that comes up shows the lunar disk or what we are told is the moon covering the sun. The red line that comes up shows the solar disk. So look at that right area. This has been predicted and demonstrated many times and suppressed. What you are seeing on the right side is the limb of the sun showing through the limb of the moon or at least that's what we are told we are looking at when we're seeing a solar eclipse like this. There are many examples um, from old Royal Astronomical Societies and other astronomers who have witnessed near an eclipse things showing through the, the, sol the lunar disk or near the new moon. So again, we see these first-hand evidential things that allow us to call into question what we've been told. Now I have filmed every lunar and solar eclipse in recent years. This is a partial solar eclipse that I shot with both my telescope and a telephoto lens. 
The reason I'm showing this is because you've got to consider that we are told the moon is roughly 400 times smaller than the sun, yet the sun is 400 times more distant, so we see this perfect kind of fit when they are aligned. And when you consider if it's even possible statistically, and I have seen people do the excuse me, statistics on this, that kind of demonstrate that it is damn near impossible for random events to have caused this kind of alignment. Um, you know, we need to question these things. We need. I'm going to back this up a little bit. He's filming an eclipse with a different type of filter that way. That's why the sun looks so diminished in light. And uh, you can actually see the dark spots on the sun. We're actually going to talk about that in part 20 as well. But this is, you see as the eclipse starts happening, because this is just a partial that he's filming. Um, I just think it's fascinating that um, uh, it doesn't even, it doesn't even, it seems like as soon as the eclipse starts coming in, it's like it changes trajectory and starts going back out, which I think is amazing. If he literally was filming it from his point of view on the land where he lives and filming this eclipse in the sky at, at just the right angle to catch it on its circumference uh, revolution in, in this firmament to where it, it, or if it's the moon, I'm going to back it up, guys, and so you can watch this again. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take the sound out so you can just see what see the motion and the path of the moon. It's coming down at a diagonal, like 2 o'clock, and then it's going to stop and go back up towards 12 o'clock. Do you see that? Yeah, I, I would love to talk to Crow Triple Seven sometime because in this clip, um, he doesn't even mention the the trajectory of the moon changing. It's, it changed. <laughs> it came down, it stopped, and it went up. <laughs> it's not the moon, guys. We're gonna keep going. Um, you you kind of get an intuition and an observational experience that goes on. And while I probably only have maybe a couple hundred hours at this point, maybe more, I'm not sure, um, I have come to a point where just accepting that this is a nuclear furnace, uh, in my mind, needs to be questioned. Uh, I think it's no different than the moon. Everything we have been told about space, been told about the sun, been told about our planet and our moon need to be questioned. All right. So... And we're going to look at another quick clip. This is actually me personally. I'm not an astronomer, but um, I, I took the light at the top of my room in my office. I laid on the, my camera on the floor and I rigged some things for to have a, um, a circular a circular object that I could show approaching the lights um, to, to mimic the idea of looking up at the sun and supposed moon coming in to solar eclipse it and why they say that they can't actually see the, the body of the moon, you know, for a day or two before it actually gets to becoming the eclipse concept. And that doesn't make any sense um, for a variety of reasons, especially it's afterwards either. They can't see it afterwards either, uh, which I think that's really interesting if we lived in a heliocentric model, because in their model, the sun is solid and it's a, it's a quarter the size of the earth. In their model, the sun is in the sky the exact same size uh, because it's 400 times smaller than the sun and it's between the earth and the sun so therefore you would see some sort of shading and shadowing coming off of it even if it didn't have any light on it because according to them all the lights on the backside then therefore we would see something we would see something just like you see a plane flying through the air and something's shining down on it even though the, you you know once the plane gets into the the body of the sun you see it better if you have a telescope lens but so I tried to mimic this idea of what can I make my own little homemade eclipse? And so it's already playing. And I've got a string attached to it. So now I'm trying to pull a circular object that's in between me and this light source from an, an exterior angle outside of the circumference of the light source into the path of the light source you know what i'm saying and i and i know this is a basic experiment a lot of people might say well the, the light is not bright enough guys 
the brighter the light, the more this should happen. The, the brighter the light, the more you should be able to see the body of the moon getting close to an actual eclipse. But yet time and time again, eclipse after eclipse, astronomers are like, man, I couldn't see that thing coming in before it crests the actual ring of the sun coming in. And only could I see it through a solar filter. Now, the people on the ground just see the shadow coming in, right? And, then, and if it's an actual full total solar eclipse, they'll see that what they call the path of totality happening. And to where it gets really dark in that area if they're even under that we're going to talk about the, how the path doesn't make any sense either there's so much to this topic guys it's so much fun and this is what we don't see in the sky uh, one second this is what we don't see in the sky this is or this is what we do see in the sky excuse me is when this whatever object this is that comes in front of the sun depends on the angle that you're at, you may not have quote unquote full totality of eclipse. And instead it just looks like this. What does that look like guys? What do we just look at for the actual Egyptian symbol for Ra? What were the hieroglyphs that we looked at? It's the same thing. First Enoch 77, 15 through 17, because in the moon, there's nothing else in her except her light. This is a quote from uh, Publius Virgilius Maro um, from approximately the first century BC. And in his book um, that he, he wrote about the gods of Greece, and um, as he talked about Jupiter and Zeus in, in sitting in Mount Olympus, this is his quote from the book. And what they believed was, meanwhile, Olympus, the seat of sovereign sway, threw wide its portals and its conclave fair, the sire, that means the authority of the gods, and the king of all mankind, Zeus, summoned the immortals to his starry court, where high enthroned the spreading earth he views. And Tecrius camp and Latium's various array, beneath the double gated dome, the gods were sitting. That's Hove, that's Jupiter Zeus, himself, the silence broke, meaning he spoke first. The Greeks thought that Jupiter Zeus, that's the Greek version of Ra, had a starry court high enthroned above the earth. And that that starry court where Zeus was sitting and called the other immortals to him was beneath a double gated dome. Now that's not the descriptions from scripture. And this place where he was sitting was called Mount Olympus. We go over more of this. Um, we'll go over more of this in a little bit, but we, we actually talked about this previously in part five. This is a uh, modern day money from Greece. They have Zeus's face on their dollar. Guys, we have the American dollar has the all seeing eye, which is the eye of Ra. It's literally the eye of Satan. The Greeks actually put his whole face on there. This is uh, just a modern or a Artistic drawing of what's the temple in Pergamum that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. That would have been the, uh, the seat of Satan, which was the throne of Zeus or Jupiter. It was a huge statue that the priests would come before and offer sacrifices. This is commonly held by Zeus, which was not just his spear, which was the trident. Also, is a different incantation of the Vajra. But he also was symbolized by the, the crown, which was this leafy uh, wreath, which was symbolized as, as his crown. This is just some, some reliefs of Zeus with other gods on the Greek architectural buildings. They viewed Satan as a person. I guess that's why I'm showing this at this point, because we're building to something, as always. We're building to something. 
So they viewed Satan as a person, guys. He's not some he's not some horned tail and horns on his head with a pitchfork that comes in all red like some bad version from Dante's Inferno or something. Or like he's not that's that's comic that's comic representation. They viewed him as a person that interacted with people and made decisions, set as king over peoples and over the earth, ruled the nations. That's how they viewed him. But the, that the Israelites and the Hebrews called Satan, the rebellious angel Azazel, from before the flood, the rest of the world worshipped him as the ultimate authority who actually had a physical location and a physical throne. And that throne was enclosed by a double-gated dome. Here's one of the ancient uh, Greek coins. The wreath is everywhere, just like on the coin. The wreath is a part of it. Let's look in Acts 14, 8 through 10. In Lystra, there was set a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. This man was listening to the words of Paul, who looked intently at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. In a loud voice, Paul called out, Stand up on your bed, excuse me, stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices in the Laconian language. The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes. This is, like, this is what they thought. So they were thinking, okay, Barnabas, he's not, he hadn't been speaking a lot. He must be the ultimate authority figure. He must be Zeus. And underneath them must be Paul, which, which we think must be Hermes, because he's the chief spokesman. Guys, what did we talk about in, uh, what was it, part 16, the Mark of the Beast, where we identified who Hermes is, who Nurgle is, who the second beast is, who goes and promotes the first beast under the authority of the dragon, under the authority of Zeus. It's Hermes. It's Hades. It's Nurgle. It's Anubis. So these guys thought, because of their, their indoctrination into the occultic religion of worshiping Zeus, and all the people under his authority, they thought, oh my goodness, this miraculous display of power that Paul and Barnabas were showing, they must be the gods that have come down to us. Come down to us. The priest of Zeus, will go on, it goes on to say in verse 13, the priest of Zeus, or let me go back to verse 12, um, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths, to the city gates, hoping to offer a sacrifice along with the crowds. So just as more validation of the understanding that the wreath was the crown of Zeus, and they would bring wreaths as representation of worship to Zeus with their sacrifices. That's why they tried to bring wreaths. The priests of Zeus tried to bring wreaths to Paul and Barnabas because they mistakenly thought these were the gods in a, you know come down to uh, help them out. This is an image of the wreath wrapped around a particular viewpoint of the lands that we call Earth, surrounded by oceans. The wreath surrounds it, just like the serpent surrounds the sun in the Egyptian hieroglyphs of Ra. This is the symbol for the United Nations. I have the, the wreath of Zeus wrapped around an aerial view of a flat view of all the lands of the earth. The circumference of the earth in the same shape of the circumference of the heavens, just like Isaiah tells us. It's not a ball. Here's their desks in the United Nation, shaped as a wreath, but that's, you know, circumstantial. Here's the main general assembly of the United Nations. Many of you guys may have seen this. I've actually done a video on their meditation room in the United Nations, which actually has an actual stone altar to Molech, which is pretty creepy. But if we, we zoom out a little bit from this general assembly of the United Nations building, you, do you notice anything unique about the top of that building, about the interior of the roof? <laughs> Looks like a luminary body with a hole in it. It's pretty amazing. 
actually specifically inside another cir uh, circular spherical shaped body that looks like a mechanical object. And it's directly overhead. Does it remind you of anything? I'm sure this is just all a coincidence. Just all a coincidence. Same thing as in this particular movie, Rogue One, um, where the, the goal of this movie, this is pretty interesting because, you know, we've talked in previous episodes the um, about, you know, the, the modern media and, and entertainment industry has all these themes and these symbolism layered into everything they do to, to get you familiar with this stuff so that when they actually are going to reveal the truth in the future, it's really not that jarring and that scary because ultimately we're at a unique place in history where the majority of mankind doesn't think like the people did in the days of Paul and Barnabas. They don't think about Zeus literally living above them in the sky and having an actual abode. So if they were to come out and tell you that that was a legit fact, it would be very jarring to people. So they have to subtly and consistently throughout time show these ideas to you so that you, by the time it's called truth by those whom you listen to as the authorities in the society, then it's not that jarring. They've been showing you the idea for a long time in many, many different forms of media and entertainment. This is just one of them. This is from 2015, um, a movie called Rogue One, part of the Star Wars saga. And the goal of this movie was that this girl had, she was being protected by these other people and she was trying to get this information about the the architectural blueprints of the Death Star in this little bag that she's carrying, which is actually like, like a big data disc. And I just thought it was hilarious that this actual symbolism is of this, of the, of the sun being eclipsed by a small black, black, dark thing. It's actually in this information, which represents, or excuse me, it's on this carrying case, which represents the information, which is the secret of this entire movie. Supposedly in, in the storyline, this girl's father created the Death Star, had all the blueprints, put them on this, you know, this huge disk drive. And she was trying to get it and take it to the people that could, you know, make use of it so they could destroy the Death Star. This information here was the valuable secret that she had to deliver for the, for the people to overcome the Death Star. And it literally has the symbolism of Ra on there. And I think that it's, it's no coincidence that there's multiple pictures of the ancient gods and, and different types of hieroglyphs, even Assyrian, Akkadian, Hittite, where they have their hybrid type style gods. Um, this particular one's a hawk-headed god, and he's got a bag as well, and he's putting knowledge into the back of people's brains, which is what the pine cones represented. See the little bags? How interesting that this is above their head. Because what are they doing? They're a general assembly to do what? Govern the nations. Or they're trying. Some some nations don't give them full autonomy, but they're definitely trying. That's their, the whole purpose of why they were created. A unifying body and council that would help create decisions for other nations to abide by. If that's not governance, I don't know what it is. What is the purpose of the all-seeing eye at the top of the 13-step pyramid on the back of the dollar bill? With the Latin inscription Annuita Coeptis on the top of the All Seeing Eye, which says he favors our undertakings. And at the bottom, where it says Novus Ordo Seclorum, which is also Latin for New Order of the Ages. Who favors your undertakings? Well, this dude looking at you, that's who. The dude looking at you favors him. Who's the guy looking at you? It's Ra. Satan. He's favoring their undertakings. And this, of course, all of this is secret society symbolism, you know, down from the 15th century Illuminati down to 17th century Freemasons. That's, that's why we read back from the Greek word Jove, J-O-V-E, or Jova, depends on how you say it. Also was just one of the names referenced by the Freemasons for the ultimate God that they worship. But I don't think you really, I don't think you get to that information until the top levels of initiation. So the the symbolism for Ra, the eye and the circle with the dot in the middle, overhead, staring down, 
upon the people. And he favors the undertakings of those who do his will. That's all right here. This is the same representation from the hieroglyph above the raw uh, of the uh, the falcon headed raw or the hawk headed raw, which is not just a sun, it's an eclipsed sun. What is the eclipse? It's the eye of raw. Look at that same symbol on the floor of the Vatican. They're sitting all over this symbol. It's, it layers the entire marble floor. It's right here. Oh, it's also in the center of their public square. Well, this is a circular square with a circle in the middle of it, obelisk in the center, a ball at the top. We're going to, you know, it's all right. So it's all there. Oh, do you guys remember the machine like looking thing with this, with the eye in the center? They have a representation of it in a, in a just like partially destroyed golden ball in the courtyard of the Vatican out in the grass lawn as an artifact to be looked at by tourists. You guys remember we talked about this in part 18? Yeah, it's supposed to look like an eyeball. That's, that's the whole point. It represents an eye. It represents somebody's eye, specifically, looking down upon you. This is why if you wanted more information about all the different spherical structures all over the world, we covered that in part 18, ball top towers. Guys, the balls, for everyone that was wondering, what, what, what do they represent? Oh my goodness, what is this? It's the eye of Ra. It represents Satan. It's an homage to the authority of Satan, and that's why they put it, most 99% of the time, they put it in the sky as high as they can. So let's take a quick moment and let's look at how do they tell us that eclipses actually work? Because that's important, right? We understand, like I've been trying to, to you know, take amateur footage and we're looking to see like, okay, this is this is what the scriptures say about the eclipse and when it's the sun, or about the, the sun and the moon and how they're described. But then when we see an eclipse, it seems to, we see to see something that doesn't quite match up with the descriptions of scripture. So does that mean scripture is invalidated? Does that mean the heliocentric model is absolutely true? Or should we actually learn how they tell us eclipses happen according to their model and see if that's true? And this is where it gets fun. So this is what they tell us, that the moon is 400 uh, times larger than the body, excuse me, that the, the sun is 400 times larger than the body of the moon. But because the, the sun is 93 million miles away from the moon, it's so small through perspective that it looks like it's the same size as the moon. But yet, in every single one of their graphics on all science websites and all NASA government websites, the depiction that you're seeing on screen here, the, the sun is always larger than the moon in order for them to get this effect of a solar eclipse only creating a shadowy dark area and a small portion of the land mass of Earth. So if half of a sphere is illuminated by the sun and in the moon looks the same size from the land of the sphere, from our perspective, if the moon looks the same size as the sun, then that means when the moon gets in front of the sun, it should block out all the light going on half of the sphere. But it doesn't do that. And they have all these <laughs> fascinating theories for why it doesn't do that. And how these little drawings here, this is directly from NASA. They always show the sun to be larger so they can accomplish this graphic to where they have apparently light goes down at a downward angle uh, in their minds. And so in this idea, because ultimately if it was 93 million miles away, the light would come in parallel, but it doesn't. So the point is in their graphic and their understanding, they're trying to show you they don't represent the sun correctly to their own model's description. The sun is always much, much, much bigger than the moon in order for them to, to get you to believe that the shadow of the eclipse creates a pinpoint area with the with the penumbrum around it, which is a much larger shaded spot around the actual umbra. So this is what they show you everywhere in all the textbooks. 
this is not a proper representation. Now, many people say, oh, it's showing you perspective. It's showing you that you're closer to the sun. Why is the earth larger then? And this one, the earth is even larger than the sun. If it's just showing me a, a, a camera angle from the side of the sun, then that means their earth is wrong too. The earth is way too big in this perspective. So the supposed darkest spot of the eclipse shining that uh, creates a shadow on the earth is what they call the umbra. The larger shaded area outside the darkest area is what they call the penumbra. And then we'll even talk about the antumbra here in a minute as well. This is from the Great American Eclipse of 2017. And they show you that darkest line here stretching from Oregon down to South Carolina is where they said the darkest point of the eclipse was, which I believe they said was approximately 70 to 80 miles in diameter or 70 to 80 miles in, in width. And then the penumbra is the less shaded spot that would stretch from Northern California to Northern Washington and from Northern Florida up to Northern North Carolina. So that's how they try to make sense of this concept that the somehow the sun, even though it's the exact same size in the sky from our natural observation, the sun somehow still gets light around the moon during a total solar eclipse. And the path of totality is only instead of blocking out the entire half of the sphere, according to their model, that only blocks out about 70 miles of shadow on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't question the government in order to believe this. <laughs> so even if we did a small, a small um, demonstration, and this, this is some of their imagery, by the way, they take a little bitty flashlight and then they change the size of the moon <laughs> to a big basketball. And they try to show you that, see, this is why you would have the umbra, which is this bigger shadow that encompasses your whole face. But then if you change the small to a small light bulb and then they're and but then they move they move the face to the penumbra to the other shaded area then they say oh that would then make the the actual darkest part of the eclipse coming off the basketball to be much bigger it still doesn't cover the entirety of the face but this is what they show you all the time they show you the big bulb with the little moon creating diagonal triangular style shadow to pinpoint on, on a small surface area of the earth instead of covering the whole half of the, of the ball earth. Uh, it's just, just nonsense, just nonsense. So what's on the left is, is what would be accurate and more, more accurate to scale within their model. What's on the right is what they show you every time. And this is not how lights and shadows work. You see that the darkest part is what they call the umbra and the penumbra is what they say is apparently um, shadowing that's coming off of the off of the earth and, and making it even bigger, which is just it. Uh, and this is them trying to describe a, um, a lunar eclipse. Here's back to a solar eclipse where the moon's between the sun and the earth. You got the small penumbra making a pinpointed conical cone shape small shadow and then the or excuse me the umbra and then the penumbra is the larger shadow that is a reverse cone still doesn't cover half the earth which is uh, you know because in their model there's a huge sun it's improper this is not what they describe with their words their words don't match what they show you they just want you to believe something because they're hiding the truth of what truly causes an eclipse This is more accurate. You should have a smaller bulb in these diagrams to show a larger, which would produce a rightly sized shadow the same size as the moon, but it does not. So I took it upon myself to try to make something. What if we had a sun that was 93 million miles away in a globe Earth? Would that sun, I would need some, oh, doesn't make sense, right? It's like, look at all this light going over to the Earth. It should go in parallel lines, but it doesn't. It comes in. An angled rays depends on where we are. But this is what they say happens to us. From our perspective, the sun is a smaller dot in the sky going to cover half of the earth with light. But then the moon during a solar eclipse travels 
in front of that sun and changes the light. But it should, if the moon is the exact same size, according to the placement and our observation, then it should cover the fullness of the moon, of the sun, and the shade should cover everywhere the sun used to be covering. But they say, oh, it's about angular perspective. It doesn't happen like that. Okay, well, then we got problems. Is this darkest path of totality that was, they, I believe they said, 70 to 80 miles in width? That is nowhere near the size of the moon, which is supposed to be a quarter of the size of the Earth in their model. Hopefully, you guys are getting how this is extremely off according to their own model. That's right, Vader Bear. You can tell it makes sense just by how much it doesn't make sense. So what is the moon? If it's not what they tell us, what is it? Let's take a quick look at another quick clip. We're going to look at the dark side of the moon, that it is something up there. There is something there. So this is actually video now. The last one was a still, but you can see normally video is does not approach the quality of a still uh, when you're using a full frame camera. And as you can see here, the video quality is just pretty darn good. Um, the focus could. All right. Someone in the chat saying that we're slandering uh, Crow Triple Seven that he does not believe the moon causes eclipses. Yes, uh, we actually had that him on camera saying that in that last uh, clip that I showed where he was saying, this is what they say the moon causes if it's really the moon. So if I didn't make that clear, I apologize. But yeah, he definitely questions it too. Definitely. It would have been a hair tighter, um, but a lot of times that's due to seeing junk in the air that prevents you from getting that last little perfect edge on focus. So those are the tools that I'm going to be taking on the road trip and you can kind of see that if I combine my abilities now with dark sky shooting and other things that I'm going to be doing I'm basically going to bring to bear more quality and power than I've ever been able to before and I'd like to thank my longtime supporter for the loan of that lens so this next clip is going to show you where I'm beginning to do new work look to the right you are looking at the darkened portion of the moon. You can see the lit portion all the way right, but I'm using the full spectrum camera and some of the settings to start to be able to dial in to look at the darkened portion of the moon when it is not visible to our eyes. You can see it. Okay, real quick, everyone. I want to address something real quick. If you look closely on these, on um, what are called potholes of the moon, I, I don't think they're, I think they're uh, um, the result of ridiculous amounts of, of uh, electrical energy flowing through them that creates these same patterns. But what they call the potholes on the moon, people will look at the shading of those indentations on the moon and they'll say, see, look, it must be the sun. How can the, the moon be given off its own light? It must be the sunlight on the moon doing this because of the shadows of those potholes, right? Guys, you can create the same effect if you take a flashlight and walk up to a glass surface, a glass door, and you look on the exterior edges of the plastic on your on the end of your flashlight and look at the exterior edges on that plastic of the light being reflected off of that glass even though the light is going through the glass too there's some of that light being reflected off of that glass back onto the plastic around the edge of the flashlight creating shadows to the opposite direction or in that way in that way it's the same concept it's because the moon is behind an enclosure, it's above us in the firmament layers. The firmament is a solid, clear enclosure likened on the glass, but I think personally, I think it's made of solid, clear sapphire. So the moon is shining its light through that. Well, some of that light is reflecting back up onto the to the surface of whatever the, the plasma or whatever the structure of the moon is. That's a simple project that anybody can do at the house to get the same effect of light going through an object, but also reflecting back onto the source of the object as well. So it, um, yeah, it's not the light of the, and, and beside there's too many observations for the light of the moon, um, the parts of the moon being lit up, not even facing the sun. If you just have to look up in the sky, you'll see it once or twice a month. It's, it's, it's amazing. So 
just to clarify that in case anybody was wondering in the crowd at the darkened portion of the moon you can see the lit portion all the way right but i'm using the full spectrum camera and some of the settings to start to be able to dial in to look at the darkened portion of the moon when it is not visible to our eyes you can see it right there and although this is really the first kind of time I'm doing it with a telescope. I have already practiced using the telephoto and I can get some pretty decent shots of this portion of the moon. Now the reason this is critical is because there have been so many reports of when there is a new moon or when the whole moon is blacked out or when it is in brand new phases so there's only slivers lit of people seeing things like stars or planets show through the darkened portion of the moon. So that is what I'm practicing and ramping up to try to film is new moons, which is a critically hard thing to do. It's difficult to even locate the moon, but then to film it when you do have it located is it's just not an easy task. So as you can see, just by hooking this up to the telescope and simply manipulating uh, ISO and aperture settings, um, I can in fact see the darkened portion of the moon as you see here and I will be able to dial this in better and to be, to be completely honest when I'm using the telephoto and it's not completely dark outside it's a bit easier to do this but I think that I've demonstrated here that I will be able to shoot the new moon and at times shoot the darkened portion of the moon and it's funny too because if you look carefully at some of these shots you can almost see what looks like it should be lit surface detail so that doesn't make much sense to me yeah that's um I, that's a whole nother topic right like of, of you know showing the, the areas of the moon that should be lit but that are not like you can see in this quote-unquote big bald spot area there's a part of it that looks like it should it should be lit because it's not it's because the light source is emanating from within and it's not coming out whatever this material is that creates the circumference of the moon of the disk of the moon is not the same um it's not a light shining on it from the exterior it's being produced from the interior coming out um and only in certain you know certain direction if you will so to speak that's why you see it brighter on the one on the right side but then towards the shadow it kind of lessens in ability like like a light shining from the interior of a curved surface would look um but then he's also trying to show you that the moon, even though the scriptures describe it as there's nothing in it when there's no light in it. There, it, I'm trying to show you this to show that he has on camera that it is something. There is something there. there I don't know what it is, whether it's plasma. Um, I don't know what it is, but there's something there that you can see even the darkened portion. It still has the circumference of the body of the moon. It's just not lit up. And that's why there's all these other testimonies that people can see things through the darkened portion of the moon at certain times. And, um, you know, that's, that is, um, uh, something that's another claim that I, I did not find a lot of good, good evidence for that. Um, so I'll, maybe we'll just keep investigating that part. But the point is there's nothing there that to illuminate from within, but that doesn't mean that the moon itself is a solid body object of some sort of stardust floating 238,000 miles around us. That's not, that's not what it is. Clearly, whatever it is, it gets illuminated because the light that comes through it means that the material on the outside is translucent to some degree. That's the whole point of what I'm trying to get at here. So what we watched earlier when he actually captured the eclipse coming in to the moon, and you could see through the outer edges of it, but not the interior body of it, doesn't make sense for the interior light of the moon to be shining through all the exterior of it and growing in light throughout the month and waning in light. Hopefully I'm saying this right. Because it's a it's not the moon eclipsing the sun, it's a dark luminary. And we're going to talk about what those are a little bit further and the testimony of other astronomers throughout history. We have a clip here from our brother Rob Skiba talking about it as well. So real quick, let's look at a, an eclipse filmed from Alaska Airlines Flight 870 a couple years back. Okay. So there's no sound to this. But this, as you can see, the center of the, see the shadow growing on the screen? 
See the sunspot on the clouds at the bottom of the screen? And then there's a shadow growing towards that sunspot as the eclipse begins to happen. But look left and right of the big shadow, which is what they would call the penumbra. The umbra, which would be the main darkened shadow spot in the center of the screen, that's growing and coming towards the camera. And it's about to overtake that, that sunspot, okay? But look left and right of it. Look at all that sunshine on the exterior edges of the clouds. This is an airplane, a 777, flying over Alaska, watching an eclipse from about 30,000 feet. And there's darkness on the ground, but you don't see anything above. So what is covering the moon? Oh, there it is. It's the Eye of Ra. It's the same symbol. This shadow that you see on the ground, maybe 100 miles at most. You can still see from this observer from 30,000 feet up, you can still see left and right of this shadow, which right now it's in full totality. This is a total solar eclipse. But left and right of the shadow, approximately a diameter left to right on the screen of maybe 100 miles or more, there's still daylight as if there's no eclipse whatsoever. Just like there was in 2017 and 2015, just like there was in 2012, just like there was in 2001. Because this thing is not the same size as the sun and it's not covering the full light of the sun encompassing the land of the earth. It's only a small segment, which means according to how shadows work, it's only going to make create a shadow according to the size of the thing creating the shadow. Think about this for a minute, guys. Whatever this dark luminary is that's covering this space down below, the main portion of darkness down below, that's the bulk of its size. And I would suggest to you the reason why there's an umbra and a penumbra, meaning there's a darkened portion and then on the exterior edges of the darkest part of the shadow, it's a little less of a shadow, is because it's seen through the outer edges of this circular luminary style body that's getting in front of it outer edges that may be see-through it's also the thing that causes that little crescent shape on the ground during solar eclipses hmm i wonder who else worships the crescent <laughs> isn't this amazing it's a beautiful it's a beautiful uh capture by this guy out of his plane window. So it's only in full totality for a few minutes, looking exactly like the eye of Ra. And then it's going to continue to move faster than the moon moves, by the way. It's going to continue to move here in just a few minutes. This, cl this clip that we're looking at is only like three minutes long. Spent a good minute of it just going into totality. It's going to stay in totality for around another minute, and it's going to move out of totality. Why do they do rituals? Why does the occult do rituals? They get so excited about these solar eclipses. Not the lunar eclipse as much, but boy, the solar eclipse, they go crazy. Who do they worship? Who's the top pantheon god that they worship? It's Ra. It's Zeus. It's Jupiter. Now he's going to zoom in. It's not the moon, guys. Yes, people are asking, how long has it been up there? Hannibal has been up there since the Tower of Babel. We're going to talk about that more in part 20. Chase, we're going to talk about your comment more in part 20. Thank you for the super chat, brother. No, it's not Jupiter. 
we're gonna, we're gonna define the eye of raw see how the shadow just went away so quickly and it's back but it, there's still darkness the strange darkness So in, in loving memory of our brother Rob Skiba, let's look at another let's look at another quick um, this is also of a different eclipse taken from an airplane, but we have uh, some narration by Rob Skiba in the background as well. Another quote: "The belief in the existence of non-luminous stars was prevalent in Grecian antiquity and especially in the early times of Christianity. It was assumed that among the fiery stars which are nourished by vapors, there move other earthly bodies which remain invisible to us. That's from Origin. Another one uh, by Diagonese of Apollonica. Stars that are invisible and consequently have no name move in space together with those that are visible. Lambert, in his cosmological letters, admits the existence of, quote, dark cosmological bodies of great size. Now, if all this is true, this may solve the problem of what we what, what do we do with things like this planet X Nibiru thing, which even in the spinning heliocentric globe model is reckoned to, to be a dark planetary body. So you guys hear that? He's reading testimony from ancient astronomers from the 1800s that talk about them acknowledging there are some sort of dark luminary bodies in the sky. He's going to talk. He's going to read another quote here in a minute that they not only cause problems with you know with the luminaries but also get in front of the stars when they're trying to look at the constellations of the stars and they can't see them they don't have any explanation someone in the chat is asking well he's not really he's making a statement but you're actually asking is it in the same level of affirmant as the sun no it's in our level it's just getting in the way between us and how we view the sun it's underneath our affirmament we'll keep going so and of course, scientists are all talking about dark matter and everything today, even in, in that standard model. So if people can talk about dark bodies in the spinning heliocentric globe expanding universe model, then why couldn't we apply the same thing to the flat Earth enclosed model? What if there are dark bodies within the dome? Uh, Robidum continues. We have now seen that the existence of dark bodies revolving about the luminous objects in the firmament has been admitted by practical observers from the earliest ages, and that in our own day, such a mass of evidence has accumulated on the subject that astronomers are compelled to admit that not only dark bodies, which occasionally obscure the luminous stars when in conjunction, but that cosmological bodies of large size exist, and that, quote, one at least is attached as a satellite to this Earth, end quote. It is this dark or, quote, non-luminous satellite, end quote, which when in conjunction or in line with the moon and an observer on Earth is the immediate cause of a lunar eclipse. That's page 116 of Zetetic Astronomy by Dr. Samuel Robinum. And actually, as I continued to search this out, I found some interesting things within. Do you guys see this? You guys see this uh, this the zoomed up close? Hindu religion. Now, see how the sun, the backlighting of the sun is not illuminating a perfect sphere. It's like there's indentations in, in it on both sides, one bigger than the other. We see the body of the moon. We film the body of the moon. It's a perfect sphere. This thing looks like it has a chunk taken out of it. Just like the Death Star in uh, Star Wars. Look, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm going to put any authority on uh, Hindu scriptures over um, biblical scriptures. I'm not taking my doctrine from the Hindus. Uh, but you know, I think if we're going to be true zetetic explorers or people who are on a genuine quest for truth, doing investigation by observation and inquiry, then we have to look at the available evidence. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how eclipses are caused, so we don't we don't get any information. You know, at least not that I'm aware of. Somebody's free to 
message me and tell me otherwise, but as far as I know, the Bible doesn't tell you how a solar or lunar eclipse takes place, like the mechanics of it, how, how it happens. So, and if these astronomers, at least from the 1800s and from antiquity, are admitting that there are dark objects in the sky, then, you know, we would expect it to show up in the literature of other people around the world. And uh, indeed we do. The Hindus uh, have these interesting characters called Rahu and Kitu in their mythology. And I got this website here when I, when I looked it up. Uh, let, let us now take a closer look at the mythical origin of the dark demon Rahu. In old Indian tales, Rahu storms across the heavens in a dark chariot drawn by eight black horses as swift as thought itself. He pursues the orbs of sun and moon, snapping at their heels with his huge jaws. In another version of the myth, however, only Rahu's head still exists, floating above the firmament, having been severed by Indra, the sun god, as the dark demon tried to steal the vital drink of the gods. Nonetheless, this decapitation did not hinder him from continuing to fly through the heavens and swallowing the sun and moon. It is just that these now passed through him unharmed and soon reappeared, freed from the lower end of his throat. In astronomical terms, this process signifies the end of the solar or lunar eclipse, respectively. Okay. Well, guys, like I said, record these. Pray for me also. Um, while I was just going over that clip, um, some weird things happened with my computer. It kicked me out of the studio, kicked me back in, kicked me out three different times. It turned my mic off. I'm just sitting here and watching with you. I didn't touch anything. That never happens. So pray for me that I get to get through part 20. We're going to look at one more small little clip here from Crow777 where he observes and films a mysterious orb that's not moving in the sky. So let's take a look. So there goes the moon. I'm swinging over right now to try to find the tail of the chem, the chem plane, the, the actual chem trail, and watch what happens here. I pick up the chem trail and I start to track down to try to catch up with the plane. And look what I see. I see this little dot. Now, it's deceiving. It's not very dark outside. It's deceiving. It's right as the sun is about to go down because I'm shooting with a full spectrum camera. When I first hit this, my first reaction was, there's no way that there's a star bright enough for me to be picking it up like this. Then I started to second guess myself because I was shooting in full spectrum, thinking that maybe it's possible. So my navigator, my host, uh, scrambled to get Stellarium going, some star maps, and the binoculars out, and we could not see this thing with binoculars, with our eyes, any visual way we attempted, we could not see it. When we got on Stellarium, I could visually locate Antares, which is a star called the Heart of the Scorpion. I could locate Saturn in the sky, um, and so I started thinking, well, the only other thing possibly bright enough this could be would be one of the claws of the Scorpion, which is doubtful, uh, there's a couple stars called, I think, Juvenal Shanubi and Zubinel Shamali or something like that, which are the stars that mark the claws of the scorpion, but they were in the wrong place. So the longer this went on, we began to realize that the full spectrum camera was picking up this very bright object that could not be seen in the visual spectrum. So what I did is I stayed on it for a long, long time, and it did not drift in the same way the background stars drifted, which was my final test to tell me this thing was something unusual. This thing was parked up there and going barely straight up in frame while the background stars, as it got, this isn't actually quite dark. I've manipulated ISO down, but it's close to dark here. And the background stars, like I said, I could see the heart of the Scorpion Antares was drifting to the right in an arc, and this object was drifting ever so slightly upward. I wonder what he was filming. So, if you made it this far, and you haven't turned off an absolute cognitive dissonance or anger, I want to applaud you, and I want to thank you for, for extending the credit to me to continue explaining and building the case. Uh, we've come to the end of part 19, and we've looked at the eclipses in the Eye of Ra. And in part 20, we'll be looking at Mother Babylon, specifically the Dragon's Lair. And for all of you who may not realize what that means, it means 
we'll be looking at the place where Satan actually hangs out. Where does he stay? Where does he fall asleep at night? Where does he live? We're going to look at it. We're going to talk about the five different ways in sci uh, from science that it's actually possible. Um, and we're going to we're going to break it down in great detail in part 20.